I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'll try to say it again. Um, I am uh, an ECE electrical and computer engineering instructor at Portland State University and the faculty advisor for the Portland State Aerospace Society here in Portland, Oregon and the US. Um, I'm going to talk about ORSAT, which is uh, portmanteau, I guess you call it, of Oregon satellite. It's uh, Oregon's first satellite, and it's a complete open source toolkit, construction kit, whatever you want to call it, for a uh, uh, CubeSat satellite that is available for anybody to use, and it's uh, it's a pretty good science platform, and so I'm kind of excited to give it to Gosh and let Gosh folks know about it. So I have a a huge number of slides, so forgive me. I'm just going to take a couple of slides and kind of step through them. So I forgive the shock and awe as I go through a bunch of slides that I don't talk about. <laughs> so and feel free to interrupt with questions. Absolutely. Um, so the, the first thing uh, to know is space. And, and since we're all science folk, I'm going to um, jump over this whole part. I just wanted to say one thing, which is kind of vaguely interesting. The kind of orbits that we're talking about are all around 200, 300 miles, which is about five, four, 500 kilometers. And that's relatively low. So everything we're talking about today is low Earth orbit. Uh, the kinds of uh, satellites we build are will only operate in LEO. They will not operate in deep space. We hope to change that one day, but that's, that's just true for right now. So that's not very far, of course, you know, we talk about gravity and you know most people don't understand what an actual orbit is where you're falling around the planet as opposed to just going up. So we, we talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we'll skip over all of this and talk a, a quick second about satellites. So satellites, you can build any kind of form factor, any kind of size. Recently in 2000s, um, we started having this form factor called a CubeSat. And a CubeSat has uh, a definition of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And you can do a one unit CubeSat, which is a small bread box size or tissue box size satellite. You can stack two of them up and that's a two U CubeSat. And then the most common kind of CubeSat is a three U CubeSat. And um, our system works on all one through three U. You can get bigger, the Chia Cube, which is following the DART mission towards Ash, uh, the uh, Didymos, Didymos, I forgot how to pronounce it. Asteroid to later today is a six U CubeSat. And there's, there's you know, the, a form around it. These are the different pictures of actual CubeSat. So a one U, a two U, and a three U, and a six U CubeSat. Now what's really interesting about CubeSats is they're real satellites. They, they're just mini little teeny tiny satellites, but they've got everything you'd expect. They've got solar power, they've got a battery pack, They've got antennas, they've got radios, and of course, they've got a science mission or a mission. Not always a science mission, sometimes it's an engineering mission, but oftentimes it's a science mission. Now, I won't get too far into this, but what's really interesting about CubeSats is not necessarily that they're all the same size. What's really interesting is that on a science, or sorry, on a flight to orbit where there's a $500 million communication satellite, um, Think of it this way, if you built a $500 million satellite, would you allow a team of undergraduates to build a satellite that's right next to your $500 million satellite? And the answer is no, you would not, because <laughs> when that undergraduate you know, thing catches fire and turns into shrapnel, you don't want it to, to hit that, what we call the primary payload. So the really interesting thing is not necessarily the, the actual size, but the box that the CubeSat goes in. So the, uh, the box protects everything else from what we build. And that's really nice because it makes CubeSats very cheap because you don't have to build them to the same specification that you build very large satellites or things that are dangerous. So it's, it's pretty great. Um, the International Space Station actually has uh, uh, the ability to launch CubeSats off, which is pretty great. And interestingly enough, not just us universities use CubeSats, but uh, this is a literal pile of CubeSats waiting to go to orbit from planet. And uh, many of you know, Planet does uh, has an orbital constellation where they can uh, image the planet once a day at 10 a.m. local time. And this is some of their constellation. And it, CubeSats have enabled this. So CubeSats are a great little thing. There have been some interplanetary CubeSats as well. Uh, Marcos A and B were the first ones, uh, which is exciting. So I'm going to um, skip all of this except to say Portland State Aerospace Society is a student group. I'm the faculty advisor. It's everything we do is open source. 
we do amateur rockets, uh, sounding rockets that only go to tens of kilometers. And we work on uh, interdisciplinary aerospace engineering projects. So we take mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer scientists, and make them fight together to build great systems. And then occasionally we're lucky enough to have the physics and science community come in and add payloads to what we build. So I'm going to skip most of this, um, but the, you know, here's a rocket launch that, that we did uh, years ago where we've got some control systems controlling how the rocket goes. So we were building avionic systems for these rockets and we realized we essentially built a CubeSat just in a cylinder, not a uh, uh, cube. So we applied and uh, got a uh, NASA free flight, which is called the CubeSat Launch Initiative uh, to low Earth orbit. And so we started building uh, started building ORSAT, the uh, Oregon's first satellite. Now, there's a problem, and you guys are all familiar with this, when you're doing a large science project or engineering project, you can build it yourself or you can buy it off the shelf. In our case, buying a, a, a one or two U CubeSat with, that we wanted would have been 50,000 US dollars. That's too much for us to, to afford. And so we couldn't just buy it off the shelf. That's what we wanted to do. Uh, and then as we looked around and as an open, already open source group, we, we really wanted an open source CubeSat and there wasn't really one around. Uh, but of course the problem with doing a DIY or do it yourself CubeSat is it's really risky because you're building everything yourself. It's probably more expensive in the long run than buying it off the shelf. Um, and you need teams of students to put things together and you need the ground systems. And, I mean, it's just a tremendous amount. So we sort of sat down and decided what we wanted was a one through three U scalable design, one that was open source, one that looked like it was a commercial off the shelf system. So you could kind of swap out systems as you wanted to. And one that was scalable, one that was, you know, not just for our mission, but you could use it for other uh, missions. And importantly, team friendly. We had these teams of students working on certain parts of the, of the CubeSat and we really needed them to work independently and in parallel. So this is a terrible idea. You should not do this. Uh, instead, you should use ours or University of Hawaii's or University of, uh, oh gosh, I forgot where they're at, sorry. Uh, there's a, the Greek, Greek Libra space designs. Uh, these are the now many uh, open source CubeSats. We're just one of them. And so don't build your own. It's a terrible idea. Use someone's existing open source CubeSat. But um, we did it, and we now have one in space, and we've got two more on the way. This is a uh, CAD drawing of ORSAT Zero, our first satellite. You can see it's a card cage-based system. So there's a back plane, which is this purple thing back here, and then each of these are cards. And each card has a separate system or a, system, a separate function. So this is a star tracker that takes images of, of stars and tells us which way the satellite is pointed. This is our battery pack right here. And you can actually pull out each of these cards. And so, so we like to joke, when one catches fire because undergraduate students built it, we just pull a card and swap it out and do something else. So um, this had a lot of really, this card cage had a lot of really good uh, capabilities. And so we really went with it. And now everything is a card. We have uh, one through three U designs and each of the different designs has the same sort of nomenclature. So we've got cards, we've got frames, we've got solar modules, we've got end caps that go on the bottom, and then et cetera. So one of the most important parts of ORSAT is that it's relatively cheap to build and that students can make it themselves if they want to. So we tried to make this buildable on a three axis CNC machine that a university might have. And so each of the structural pieces are relatively simple to put together. It does require uh, anodization, but it's just aluminum milling, which is pretty good. Uh, it's got some really nice thermal properties to it as well. So if you have a high output science mission, you can dump the heat into the frame. And if you have something that needs to be cooled, you can isolate it from the frame. And we actually thermally tune it using this cute little system where we have card clamps. So you put the cards in and they're loose, but then you come out from the outside and we can pull in these wedge systems that clamp the cards in 
and that way they can uh, get through vi launch and vibration testing and all the kinds of other stuff and have tunable thermal properties. So we did, we vibration tested this and it does work. It's, it's probably too heavy and too much of a battle tank, but you guys have all know what it's like to have teams of, you know, different volunteers working on something. It's kind of got to be bulletproof, right? We've done some thermal modeling on it to make sure that the science payloads and the, the various radios that put out power all can uh, keep being at relatively decent temperatures. It turns out it depends what orbit you're in uh, radically changes the, the final temperature of your satellite. So in most sun synchronous orbits going around the poles, we'll be in, the, we'll be in about the minus 10 to zero degrees C regime. I'll skip over this. Everything is kind of like lean manufacturing. We make kits for the thing. So what you see right there is a 1U kit. So if we were building 1U, we grab out the 1U kit and build it up. So the guts of the satellite are relatively simple. Uh, there's a battery voltage that get, gets distributed to each card. There are, we put all of our radio frequency and for radio communication and, and science payloads all on the back plane here. So they use micro strips to go up and down the bus. So we literally have zero wires uh, on the entire satellite. Everything goes on the back plane. And so if your science mission has a lot of data, we can even use the auxiliary for ethernet or whatever else you need. It uses the controller area network or CAN bus, which is used in cars quite often. It's a terrible bus, but it, it turns out it was the only one that made sense for power and weight. Uh, we use very simple circuit boards, two layer and four layer, which are now very cheap. Oshbark has, has sponsored us, which is why all of our circuit boards are purple is because that's their signature color. <laughs> so we have a purple satellite, which is both adorable and, and funny all at the same time. So we have three levels of computing on board. For the sort of housekeeping, we have a Cortex M0, that's just a STM32, if you know microcontrollers, relatively easy to program and, and low power. We have a controller, an onboard computer that uses a slightly more powerful one. And then for the star tracker and the GPS receiver and probably your science missions or science imagers for sure, we have a single chip Cortex A8 that runs Linux. And so that actually runs all of our imaging systems. And these all talk on the canvas. The other thing that's really important is to onboard your team, you need really cheap tools. And so you can buy an $11 to, uh, development board for at least the M0 and M3 processors, get the students or team members up and running, switch to a prototype board, which is only about a hundred bucks, and then finally have them be able to work on the actual more expensive and more um, valuable uh, cards. Same thing with the Linux box. For $35, you can buy the Pocket Beagle, which is a full Linux computer in a, on a single chip with a SD card. And then once you're done understanding how this works, you can move to one of our Octavo-based boards. Um, everything has common debug tools. You know, we try to make it as easy as possible. So every single card has this little connector that you can plug in a little debug port and get access to your computer. And then we have, we also try to make all of the integration tools as well. So this is what we call flat sat. This is where we have a ribbon cable where you can plug all the different cards into and get access to the oscilloscope or multimeter or whatever else you need. So I'm gonna now mostly jump over this and get to the two science missions that we're working on, which I think are relatively interesting. Um, and Bree, what time do I have until? I think I've forgotten what time I should talk until. About half past. Um, so you can, Great. at half past, we're going to switch over to Maria. So if you have any questions as well, I'd suggest trying to sneak them in there before as well. Great. Okay, good. Um, and let me know if you guys have questions and, and I'll stop and answer them. I'm happy to do that. So awesome. Thank you. There's, there's solar modules uh, that power the thing using gallium arsenide solar arrays. There are battery packs. We have the onboard computer that kind of runs everything, turns everything on and off. If you make a science card, then this uh, onboard computer will turn it on and off and get the data from it and send the data down to the ground. Star Tracker, like I said before, which also acts as an external camera. We have a, our own GPS, which is a software-defined radio GPS receiver that uh, you can do actual uh, uh, interesting stuff with, which is one of the reasons why we built it. And then 
not on the one we've flown, flown in space, but in upcoming missions, we'll have an attitude control system where we can actually use magnet torquers, which are simply solenoids that create a magnetic field, a dipole moment that we can torque against the Earth's magnetic field. And that's great because that allows us to point the satellite without fuel. The same thing goes with reaction wheels. We can spin up and spin down reaction wheels to point the satellite faster than we could point with the magnet torquers. So unfortunately, not only do you need to build a satellite, your own satellite, but you also have to build your own ground station. And thank God the SATNOG system exists. This was built by Libra Space, and it stands for the Satellite Network Open Ground Station. Amateur radio enthusiasts and anyone really in the open science community can build one of these. They're open source. They're a receive-only ground system. And I got to tell you, 100% of the telemetry that came down from our satellite was through the SATNOG system. So it gives you your own open source, uh, globally distributed ground system, which has been fantastic. In fact, kudos to the uh, folks in Australia and uh, I think Dublin, uh, Ireland, who got most of the packets from our satellite for whatever reason, they had great ground systems. Um, so, uh, we, but receive only is not enough. You also need to command the satellite. So we now have another open source project built on top of SatNogs, which is what we call the university class open ground system and station. And this basically has transmit capabilities, but it's much more expensive. One of these small SatNog systems you can build for a couple hundred dollars, US dollars, and even cheaper, you can 3D print and build stuff easily yourself. One of these is more professional, has power amplifiers, costs more like 10 to 15,000 US dollars. So it's a much more capable, transmit capable system. But we've got three of them being built, one at U University College London, one at Cal Poly Pomona, and then you see the one for us up in um, Portland, Oregon. We have, of course, an adorable logo, which is a unicorn with a helical antenna for a horn. Anyway, all right. So uh, what's going on with us? Uh, we have three missions. Uh, this one's in space already, flew on March 15th. Its entire mission was to just demonstrate our open source bus. Uh, space flight gave us a free ride to space. In the year 2022 and further, you can get free rides to space if you have an open source or, or educational-based payload. So that's a pretty great thing these days, which is that there's a, it's, a space has really opened up in the last five years. Um, it was, in fact, Oregon's first satellite. And thanks to all the folks who made that possible. Uh, this, we flew on an Astra launch vehicle from Kodiak, Alaska. And I won't play the video because we don't have time, but you can go look up what that uh, flight looked like. Uh, and we have some links to what the data coming down, the satellite's no longer transmitting for, for reasons, uh, but it worked great for about a month before it automatically stopped transmitting and it can't hear us say, yeah, continue to transmit. So it's happily working away in orbit silently. <laughs> Great. <laughs> anyway, the things you learn, right? For your first uh, prototype is always terrible. So our second one is being delivered in December. And this one is a test of the attitude determination and control system. And once this one flies, then we'll be able to make the first steps towards flying. And here's the inside guts of that. Uh, you can see the magnet torquers and the reaction wheels. Uh, that finally gets us to our original mission from 2017 called ORSAT-1. And this is kind of fun because it's got two really neat science missions. One's actually, I shouldn't call it science, it's really a STEM mission. Um, uh, but let me talk about the science mission first because apparently I'm going to. So the science mission that we're flying is called the Cirrus Flux Camera. It's a short wave infrared camera with uh, three different uh, filters on it to look at, uh, and, oh God, I, I forgot to put the, the, uh, the band. It's 900 uh, nanometers, 1.3 and 1.53 micro, micrometers, I'm pretty sure, in the uh, shortwave infrared. And we're, uh, we have partners at the University of College London and University of Maryland, Baltimore County that are helping us with this system. And the whole idea is that we are uh, mapping the global uh, uh, distribution of high altitude cirrus clouds, like 12 to 15 kilometer cirrus clouds. We got to fly this as a prototype on a um, NASA high altitude student payload and got some pretty decent uh, images from it. I'll let this play for just a minute. Uh, 
So it's a little bit hard to see. This was only a single band. And down the road, you'll start to see some clouds, uh, including some cirrus. These are not cirrus clouds, but in a bit, in a bit, I believe you'll see some cirrus. Well, I'd have to look it up. There, there we go. I believe that's some cirrus right in there. So it, it's very exciting. We've flown this once, so already seen this, and this will fly in the upcoming RSAT one. Uh, and we'll get real science data, which will be published, which is exciting. And again, this is all open source. So if you wanted to fly your own serious looking camera or shortwave infrared camera, you could grab our stuff. The second mission is adorable. It's a STEM outreach mission. So science, technology, engineering, and math. And the idea is that students build their own ground station, handheld ground station that they hold. We point the satellite and broadcast live video from space to them. And so they actually get their own satellite for 10 minutes as it passes overhead, which is pretty great. So we've got a high gain antenna and uh, pretty great. We've got this single piece Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. There's actually a great YouTube video on it uh, that you're welcome to go look up. If you just look for a space telescope, you'll, well, no, now that the web is out, look for a micro space telescope and you'll find this and it's pretty great. That's, uh, you can, oh, there it is. It's uh, from Huygens Optics if you're interested. And that's the actual telescope, by the way. It's that big. So the kids will build their own ground systems, and this is what this looks like. And then uh, instead of saying this, they'll actually be able, kids will actually be able to see their own high schools from orbit. We add about six meters per pixel. So that's about it for us. Um, let me just throw some stuff out there. Feel free to contact me. Uh, feel free to hit our website. And all of our stuff is on GitHub, so you can download all of that. And we're hope, hoping to hear from you. We're always looking for collaborators at all times. We have no idea what we're doing. And so it's great to work with other people around the planet. Thanks.